All right, before I get started with the sermon this morning, I just want to plug the Wednesday night service is where we're going through the book of Psalms. And as that psalm that we just sang, um, you know, you, if you uh, come to our Wednesday night service, you're going to hear a lot of that. And one of the things that, that we're trying to do here as a church is to sing more of the psalms. Uh, the Bible talks about singing psalms. You know, there's a songbook, and they were intended uh, to be sung. That's, that's what the songbook is. It's obviously the Word of God. We believe it is the Word of God because it's in the Holy Scripture. But the Bible says that, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. That's New Testament, right? So uh, you could say, oh, psalms are Old Testament, but the New Testament teaches us to sing, uh, uh, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Which is why we sing the psalms. We're trying to do that. Now, we don't know what... Uh, tune or melody that those songs had when they were sung in the Old Testament, but um, we are trying to put more psalms to music so that we can sing them. And the great thing about that is that as we live in a world where songs are increasingly getting devoid of doctrine, well, the psalms are packed full of doctrine. So uh, that's why we sing the psalms. So hopefully that's a blessing for you. Uh, but anyways, my sermon this morning has nothing to do really with any of that. I'm going to be teaching this morning on the subject of rewards in heaven. So uh, we started off in 2 Corinthians 5. We're also going to be turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and looking at those in depth. Uh, both of those passages are talking about the judgment seat of Christ and the rewards that we will receive. So I've got a lot of content to go over this morning because I like to try to, to, to prove all things and, and um, I want to be focusing a lot on the fact of, or looking at discovering, you know, eternal rewards, maybe versus temporal rewards, or can you lose your rewards and things like that. There's a discussion that came up recently about this subject, and I want to just go more in depth and just uncover what the scripture has to say about this so we could just have a good understanding. Now, just as way of introduction, of course, we believe that salvation is by grace through faith. It has nothing to do with any of your works at all. So as we get into this passage about the judgment seat of Christ and being judged on your works, this is not referring to salvation. This is, in fact, only for believers who are already saved, people who are already saved. And we'll see that as we get into this passage, that it's only saved people who are there. They're already all going to heaven. But this is a specific event that happens where you're judged based on the events or the, the actions in your life, based on the works that you've done in your own personal life. Uh, you know, we believe that salvation is a free gift, 100% free. It has nothing to do with you. You say, well, what if someone, you know, puts their trust in Jesus Christ, they believe on Jesus, but then they do all these bad things. Are they still going to heaven? Yes, they are. Amen. Well, then why should I even do anything good is what people want to argue about. It's like, well, there's a lot of reasons to still do good. Right, and this is a way to think about it. You know, when you're when you're saved, you're born again. You're a child of God, right? You must be born again. Jesus said you must be born again in order to see the kingdom of God. We need that new birth. How do we get that new birth? John one tells us, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And just like so many other passages that talk about being saved is by believing. Acts chapter 16, verse 30 and 31, it said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? It said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Believe. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I could go on and on and on and on, quoting all the verses that talk about faith alone for salvation. Nothing to do with your works. You are saved by grace through your faith in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That is given you for free. It has nothing to do with your good works. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Because this is what the Bible teaches. So our salvation is completely separate from anything else that we do with our life. It's just something that's given to us for free that we receive because we put our trust completely in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We're trusting that the work that he did is all that's needed. And our works have nothing to do with us being saved. However, there is good reason to work, right? After you're saved, we ought to live a righteous life. We ought to live a godly life. As a child of God, 
I ought to obey the commandments of my heavenly father. I ought to try to be a pleasing son in his sight. And just like people will say, oh, well, I guess you could do whatever you want. Well, yeah, my physical parents, my earthly parents, there's nothing I could do that would make me no longer be their child. Does that mean I'm just going to go run out and just do a bunch of things that's going to make them ashamed, make them disapproving, make them upset or angry with me? Of course not. Why would I do that just because I, just because I can and still be their child? Do you see what I'm saying? So the motivation saying, well, why should you even follow the Bible? Why should you even follow the commandments? Well, one, I respect my father, my heavenly father. Amen. Two, I mean, there's, there's a lot of reasons, right? I love God. Three, I understand that his commandments are actually good for me, not bad. I'm not missing out on anything right. by living this lascivious, licentious lifestyle of debauchery and, and, and perversion and, and whoremongering or whatever. That's not... That is not a good way to live. Amen. That is a way that's going to bring misery and destruction to your life. So it's not like, oh, wow, but you can't do all these things. Yeah, I know. And I'm good with that. Amen. I don't want to do those things. God knows what's best. So there's, you know, there's all these stupid arguments against the truth, but they all fall flat. Now, but what we do here does matter, right? In the, in the regard of being able to earn reward. So everyone that's saved goes to heaven, but heaven isn't equal for everybody. And what I mean by that is that some people will be given more rewards than others. And this is a concept that is taught all throughout scripture, um, but we're gonna focus on specifically, because a lot of aspects you can look at when it comes to rewards, but we're gonna focus, well, a lot of time just focusing on, well, what happens if, for example, you're living really godly and really righteously and doing things that you know would earn rewards, but then you backslide and maybe just end up doing a lot of really bad things later in your life before you die? Like, what happens with that? You know, a good example I, I think of is, well, what happens with King Solomon, right? I mean, King Solomon was clearly saved. He was a prophet of God. Uh, he penned down most of the, the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon, you know, all these, these great works. He was used by God in a great way, uh, gave us many of those uh, books of the Bible. Holy Ghost worked through him and uh, had a lot of wisdom and great teaching and great understanding. But his heart was drawn away from the Lord through the, the heathen women that he married and they turned his heart to where he actually, you know, uh, erected altars to false gods and, and, you know, near the end of his life really just did some shameful things and not good things. And it's like, well, what, what about him? Because we know he clearly did some really good things early on in life. So what happened? So this is what we're going to dig into and see what the scripture says about it. Now, I'll start off also just saying this. You, know, you come to your own conclusion on these things, but I spend a lot of time trying to do research. If you find something else, you could come to me after service and say, hey, Pastor, I found this other passage that I think relates to this, um, and, and I'd be happy to hear about that. So, but I have a lot of notes. So, again, I'm, I'm being a little wordy this morning, so I'm going to just dig into the passage. Let's look at verse number 1 here, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 that we just read. The Bible says, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands eternal in the heaven. So this is talking about our earthly house being our body. The house that we dwell in, that our soul dwells in right now is this physical body, but we have a house in heaven. So when this body goes away, we will be clothed upon in heaven. Let's see, let's keep reading here. Verse number two, for in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. We have a lot of, you know, we have aches and pains and sorrows and all kinds of other things in this life, in this tabernacle, in this house that we dwell in on this earth. And that's all going to be swallowed up. This mortality is going to be swallowed up of life when we pass on and go to heaven. And especially when we have that new body at the resurrection, when uh, we have that, the body that's transformed and we have a, a, a brand new tabernacle. And that's what we earnestly desire, right? Yeah. 
uh, that's that's it's a much better place to be at than in the house that we have right now because we're living in this body of death, this body of sin, this body that draws us away from serving the Lord. We don't want to be in this body. We want to be in a righteous body with the full redemption of our body. Verse number five. Now he that hath wrought us for the self same thing is God who also hath given unto us the earnest of the spirit. Therefore, we are always confident knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. So these few verses is explaining you know, God's given us the everyone who's a believer has the earnest of the spirit. What's the earnest? It's like that down payment. That's the promise of the full redemption. So when you get saved and God seals you with that Holy Spirit of promise, the Bible says, for God that cannot lie, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. We have eternal life, and it's given to us by a promise. It's given to us as a gift. When you get saved, God seals you, and he seals you with the Holy Spirit of promise. And since it's God's promise, we know that it can't fail. God never backs out of his promise, never breaks his promises. God makes a promise, it's going to come to pass. So he gives you, he seals you with the Holy Spirit of promise. You belong to him. You are redeemed. But you're not fully redeemed yet in this sense that you still have a sinful body, right? If you're, if you're born again today, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have a new spirit, and God has sealed you with the Holy Spirit of promise. Okay, that's new. You're a new creature all, you know, old things have passed away, behold, all things become new, but you still have this old flesh. We still have this old body, this old tabernacle. But we know and we desire to just shed off this old man and to be with the Lord. And this is why we are always confident. Verse 6 was saying, hey, he's given us the earnest of the Spirit, but we're, this is why we're always confident. I know that I'm saved. I know that I have a home in heaven. I know that there's a tabernacle waiting for me that, hey, as, as long as I'm here in the body, I'm absent from the Lord. But as soon as I depart from this body, I'm going to be with the Lord. Why? Because he sealed me with the Holy Spirit, a promise. It's already done. It's a done deal. We walk by faith, not by sight. Verse number nine. Now it says, wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Now, he just got done saying we're confident that when we're absent from this body, we're going to be present with the Lord. We know that. We know that we're going to heaven. We know that that's our destination. So because we know we're going to be there, we work, we labor. We're going to work in this life because we want to be accepted of him. Now, accepted doesn't mean accepted into heaven. It's not your entrance into that heavenly home. It's that acceptance that any son would want to have of their father. Right? My son is never going to stop being my son. Right? It's impossible physically. But the way that he lives his life is going to determine whether or not he's accepted of me. Right? Right? Now, look, I'm not going to expect perfection out of my, you know, like I'm going to understand that he's not perfect, but the choices that he makes in his life could cause him to not really be accepted of me, even though he's my son, even though I'll always love him, even though there's always a place for him, even though that will never change. There's an acceptance of, look, I am proud of you. You're doing a good job. Uh, uh, you're pleasing in my sight. I want to bless you and reward you because of how good you are and, and what you've done, right? That's the type of acceptance that we're talking about here, which is why we labor so that way when we're in the presence of God, hey, whether we're here or whether we're there, we want to be accepted of God. We want God to be pleased with us. Verse 10 goes on to continue, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We're all going to be standing before the judgment seat of Christ. Every believer is going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So whatever you do with your life, how you spend your life, whether it's good or bad, that's all going to come up in front of the judgment seat of Christ. The Bible ends, continues, says, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in 
your consciences. So we say, what does it mean there, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord? Well, first of all, anyone who comes in the presence of the Lord, like everyone in Scripture, falls down on their face and has a very significant fear of God in the presence of the Almighty. Everybody does. Now, think about it this way. You know you're going to be standing in the presence of the Lord. Well, it's going to happen. Yeah. There's going to be this judgment seat of Christ. You're already going to be just like awestruck and, and falling down, and especially when you look at your life. Right? Now, if you, just, if you were to die today and just think back on your life, ask yourself this question. How pleased is God going to be with every day of your life? Now, I, I don't know the answer that you do, right? But we're already going to be standing in front of the Almighty God, which, again, when you read your Bible and you see great men of God, Elijah or Elisha, you know, these, you know, they all just fall flat like they're dead. Moses, right? They all are just, you know, trembling at the presence of God. There's going to be, how much more is that going to be if you did nothing for God? Now, you know you're going to heaven. I mean, that is a free gift. You're saved, right? It has nothing to do with how well you live your life. You're, you're going, but you are going to stand before Christ. You're at the judgment seat of Christ. You're going to stand there. He's going to, you're going to say, he's okay, well, here's, here's everything you did. And, and turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to see a little bit more on how this actually happens. It says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Look, you're going to be standing before God. So make the best use of your life now so that you could get good rewards and you could actually be, have some level of confidence going, okay, look, we, we all know we're going there having wasted some time and, and have, you know, having done things that are not good and, and whatever. We, we know that. But we also know we're forgiven of our sin. Right? So God's not going to use this, by the way, this judgment of Christ as a punishment session for your sin because Christ paid all the punishment for your sins. Amen. So this is not a punishment session. This is going to be where rewards are given out. And like I said, we're going to see this a little bit more clearly on how this happens in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So let's dig into that, that passage Verse number 11 in 1 Corinthians 3, the Bible reads, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Christ. Jesus Christ is the foundation, right? You're not going to build any works or any riches or rewards or anything upon any other foundation than Christ. Because if you don't have Christ, you're going to burn in hell. And you're not going to have any rewards of any kind, no matter how good of a life you lived. No matter how many people you help in this world, if you don't have Christ, if, you're not, if your faith isn't in Christ to save you, you don't have anything. Literally have nothing. So you have to have that foundation. Verse number 12. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, which is what we ought to be doing in our life, building on that foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. So listen, six, list, lists six things there that you can just be building with, right? Gold, precious stones, Silver, wood, hay, stubble, all these different things. It says, every man's work shall be made manifest. It's going to be, it's going to be made known. It's going to be shown for what is your, your work. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. So all the work that you've done is going to be tried. It's going to be tested. And say, here, it's going to be tested by fire. So it's going to say, well, how good was this work really? You invested all this time. Here's what you did with your life. Here's how you invested it. Here's how you spent your time. How good is this? Verse 14 says, If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. So when it's tested, if it, if it makes it through the fire and it still is there, that has value. You're saying, okay, well, now you're going to get a reward for that. God tested your works it came forth. Here's everything that came out of the fire. These were good things. These are valuable things in God's eyes that are going to get you a reward. 
It says, if any man's work shall be burned, so it's great, okay, here's, here's all the works I did in my life, and you just kind of pile it all up in one big pile at the judgment seat of Christ. This is the imagery, right? This isn't like physically going, you're not going to see your works in front of you, but it's, it's, the, it's the mental image to help us understand how things are going to be weighed, how things are going to be given out. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Well, what's the loss? The loss of your time, the loss of your effort, the loss of your work. Because what you did didn't matter to God. It says, but he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. That even if someone has no works, you're still saved. Amen. And this is what I was talking about. That, you know, your work is just gone. Right? You're not going to be chastised for sinning, for wasting your time, but you just don't get anything. That's the loss that you suffer. It's like, hey, man, you lived however many years God gave you. And you got nothing really to show for it. I mean, hey, and look, thank God everyone that's going to heaven goes to heaven, right? I mean, that's like, if you're just talking about heaven and hell, obviously the choice is heaven. You, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be wonderful just to be in heaven. You, you've escaped hell. Praise the Lord for that. But now that you're saved, you know you're escaping hell. Right? If you're saved today, you're, you know you're saved. You're going to stand before the judgment of Christ. Like, it's going to happen. So if you know this is going to happen, if you know your works are going to be presented there, how ought you to be living? Yeah. Maybe you ought to be motivated to start thinking about the future, right? Yeah. I mean, we live in a society, a culture that teaches live for the now, get your credit cards, you know, buy whatever it is that you want, all your comforts. You deserve it. You're entitled to it. You should have two cars, a house, a boat, uh, you know, whatever. All, all the luxuries of this world, your cell phone, right? I'm, this is one thing. You're going to hear this probably until I stop pastoring here or the day I die, whichever comes first. It might be the same day. <laughs> you know, people who just treat like your phone as just, of course, I have to have a phone. Like, you have to have a $1,000 computer in your pocket? Like, really? Really? Sorry, I grew up in a day where a phone hung on a wall with a spirally cord. Amen. And that's it. And, you know, there's people who are older than me that probably remember not even having a phone. <laughs> I remember getting our first voice, not a voicemail, everything's called voicemail now, an answering machine. An answering machine. So if you weren't home and someone's calling, they could leave a message. Like... This is all brand new stuff, but now it's just, it's just like, oh, yeah, well, of course I'm going to have that. And I'm just going to go in debt for this. I'm going to go in debt for that and go in debt for, you know. The wise person, and I'm just talking about financially speaking, isn't going to be going into debt for all these immediate things. You're going to be thinking about the future, right? I mean, even the wisdom of this world is going to teach you, hey, if you're young, you know, you can start investing some money in a 401k. You'll have this money, you know, just this little bit here, a little bit there. You put this away. It's going to build and you're going to accumulate wealth over time and all this other stuff. But what, what do you have to do? You have to think about the future. You have to be planning for the future. You have to be making decisions about the future. Not just what am I going to get today, but also, hey, there's a future ahead of me. Well, as believers, as Christians, we ought to be thinking about the future too. Now, it's not in the carnal things, right? Because we're not living this life just to amass and accumulate as much financial wealth as possible. That, that's foolishness because we know we can't take it with us. We know it's not going to really get us any happiness anyways. Life isn't all about making money. It's about people. It's about uh, serving the Lord and, and living righteously and, you know, one day then we will get rewards. And here's the thing. Those rewards do last forever. So the work, when you're standing at the feet of Christ and work abides the fire, it, it makes it through. That's it. It's tested. It's done. And it's yours. And that lasts forever. Not however many years you have left on this earth. Forever. Like, that's, that's yours now eternally. That's valuable. This is what we need to be 
thinking on and looking on, look, if all your work gets burned up, yeah, you're still saved, as the passage says. But we want more than just that. We ought to. I do. And it's not just because I'm greedy or selfish, because getting these rewards actually benefits other people. And we'll see them, and I'm spending too much time on this right now. Let's keep going in this passage, because I've got, I, like I said, I've got a bunch of other scriptures I want to go to. Verse number 16, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now, again, that temple, I, man, I didn't really want to get into all this this morning. Um, this isn't talking about you losing your salvation, but if you start defiling your temple, your earthly tabernacle, God can just extinguish your life here on earth, then you're definitely not earning any rewards. So your work is cut. That's why I said, hey, think about what you've done in this life. Is God going to be pleased with what you've done? Are you going to be pleased with how much you actually did and, and the time you spent doing godly things? And as we'll see in a little bit, other things that we can see clearly will give you eternal rewards. Have you really spent a lot of time doing that or not? And you start messing around with this body that God gave you, you can just cut that short real quick. Then you're done. I mean, that's, that's your opportunity to earn rewards here on this life. It's like, okay, well, that's done. Uh, turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 10. So hopefully you have a little bit of understanding about the judgment of Christ and earning rewards. It's clear that those are eternal rewards because you receive them, they abide the fire, and they're going to be good, right? They're going to last. But there's other, when, when you study out rewards in Scripture, there's definitely temporal rewards versus eternal rewards. And there's mentions of receiving rewards where it doesn't specify either way. Now, let's give you an example of that without, because it's too exhaustive to go through every passage. But here's an example in Proverbs 25, verse 21. The Bible reads, If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. That doesn't say how the Lord's going to reward you, right? He could, he could easily reward you temporally by making that person who's troubling you, your enemy, to stop troubling you, like that would be a reward in itself by God protecting you from that evil, like that alone can be a reward in itself, right? It doesn't clearly say like, hey, this is going to actually earn you something else in heaven. Now, I personally think that it will, but I can't teach that as a fact without backing it up a little bit more. So, you know, you got to kind of take all the, the scriptural references here and, um, you know, judge it for yourself and, and get the whole thing in context. We're going we're gonna to see a pattern, though, I think. You'll see the same pattern that I see when I look through and study out the rewards. Um, because there's, there's some things we do, well, all the things we do should be because God commands it. But there are definitely certain things that are uh, specified here, and we'll see one here as, as an eternal reward. Um, and we're going to see how they tie together, and they're very similar for the most part. Verse number 39 in Matthew chapter 10, the Bible reads, He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. He that receiveth you receiveth me, and he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. You're going to have to go back and read the context later. The context really helps out a lot in this passage. But there's, a, you know, obviously from starting in verse 39, a, a concept here of sacrifice here and in, in giving and in living in a way where you're, um, giving up some things. But then it also just says, hey, if you receive me, you receive him that sent me, which is Jesus speaking. If you receive Jesus, you receive the Father. And then it says in verse 41, he that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he that receiveth a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. 
So receiving these people, the Bible says, you'll get a reward for that. Verse 42, And whosoever shall give to drink unto one of these little ones a cup of cold water only in the name of a disciple, verily I say unto you, he shall in no wise lose his reward. And this is a verse that stands out to me because it's, he's saying, look, you're not going to lose this reward. And as we look into more rewards, this seems to be probably one of the smallest things that you can do, giving a cup of water to someone, right? I mean, is, is that really that hard? No, but the point is he's saying, but you're not going to lose that reward. And, and for this reason, as we continue on, we're going we're to see some more spelled out. I don't think that you'll ever lose the rewards that you've already earned for the Lord. So, you know, that question came up earlier where I was saying this has kind of prompted this, this study through Scripture to, to give an, a full answer for this. Well, if one of the smallest things that you could possibly do where the Bible says you're going to get a reward just by giving a drink of coffee, saying, look, you're not going to lose your reward even for that. It kind of tells me that, like, okay, well, whatever you can do to earn a reward, it's not just going to be forfeited or lost, right? And if you think about it, it still makes sense in the same capacity that no amount of sin is going to make you unsaved, and no amount of sin can undo any good that you've already done. So whatever point you are in your life, if you've already done work and you've already labored and you've already earned some things, you're going to have that. Like it, it, it's, it, it has etern either, either something that you do has eternal value or it doesn't, right. right? So if I do something today that has eternal value, it has eternal value, right? So if, if I've earned that today, if I, you know, whatever I do tomorrow won't change the fact that what I did today was of eternal value. Does that make sense? But we're going to see this, and turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Actually, no, we're going to go, we'll go back to 1 Corinthians 9. Um, I want to make the best use of my time here. Yeah, turn to Matthew 5. We'll, we'll, uh, if I have time, I'll go back to 1 Corinthians 9. So rewards that you earn, if you've already earned them, I believe they last forever. I think that that passage there is clear. It's saying, look, you're not going to lose that reward. But as we also look through this, there's going to be other passages that might sound like, well, you may not get a reward. Okay. And here's where we don't know exactly how all rewards will work. We saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, your works being, you know, uh, tried by fire. But I also believe this, and we're going to get into the crowns in just a second, but the crowns are tied in with what I'm going to show you here in Matthew chapter 5, about being persecuting and enduring. I think there's also rewards that are given for enduring and for making it through difficult things that you won't get unless you actually make it all the way through, right. right? So if you faint, if you quit, if you back out of serving God, you don't earn that reward. Look at Matthew 5, verse number 10. The Bible says, Blessed are ye that are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So we see here that, that persecution, when people start saying all manner of evil against you, this, can, this will earn you great rewards in heaven to the point where God's saying, look, be happy now. Now, if, if, why would I be happy now if I could forfeit that reward later? You know what I mean? Like, like I'm going to be happy now because I've earned that. Like, if people are, are persecuting me and I'm suffering for, for Christ's sake, as the Bible said here, look, I could be exceeding glad and happy because my reward's going to be great in heaven. Amen. And any time you are persecuted for righteousness' sake, persecuted for Christ's sake, then 
you earn rewards for that as well. Turn, if you would, to um, <coughs> Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, verse 32. The Bible reads in Hebrews 10, 32, But call to remembrance the former days in which, after you were illuminated, ye endured a great fight of afflictions. Partly whilst you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. For ye had compassion of me and my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. So there's a few things being brought up here. We're going to keep reading in just a second. He says, after you were illuminated, after you came to the knowledge of the truth, right? Basically, after you get saved, you endured a great fight of affliction. So you had some afflictions come your way. And then he says that you had compassion on me in my bonds, Apostle Paul, when he was in jail, when he was in bonds, he says, you took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. What does that mean? They were supporting the Apostle Paul in prison, right? The spoiling of their goods, they're giving to him to help him out. They don't care that it's costing them. They're giving to him. And it says, uh, knowing yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. He's saying, you didn't care about your wealth here because you're trying to help ultimately spread the gospel. Apostle Paul was an evangelist. He's going out, preaching the gospel, getting churches started, doing great work for the Lord. So the, the help that they were doing to help him was also apparently earning them rewards in heaven because they have a substance, an enduring substance in heaven. Verse 35 says, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. So, you know, of course, you, you have to do these things and complete them in order to receive the reward for those things. Hebrews 11 talks about Moses. It says, By faith, Moses, in verse 24, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. So he knew that he was going to earn rewards by suffering affliction for righteousness sake, for Christ's sake, as opposed to living lavishly and luxuriously, growing up in Pharaoh's house and having all the, the, that Egypt could offer him. Amen. He says, you know what? I don't want that stuff. This is temporal. It's just in this life. It's, it's not all it's cracked up to be. I'm going to esteem greater riches found in the, the reproaches of Christ. Now, there's a, a certain similarity I found in multiple scriptures here. And turn, if you would, to 2 John chapter 1. And while you're turning there, I'm going to read uh, one of the passages I skipped over. 2 John chapter 1 is where you're going. I was trying to maintain a, a vein of thought, why, why, reason why I skipped this over, but when we're talking about eternal rewards, one of the things that we saw, enduring persecution, clearly you receive rewards for that. But another thing that has eternal value is winning people to Christ. And th this is probably one of the easiest things to just understand. When someone puts their trust in Jesus, Right? They're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise I was talking about earlier. The, the, their eternity is changed forever. They become a new creature. They're born again. That clearly has eternal value 
because that person now is going to live in eternity in heaven with the Lord. Like that's, that is, uh, there's no doubt about that, that that has a value, the value of a soul, the value of someone receiving eternal life is of utmost value. And that of all things, if you were to look back on your life and say, I helped lead this person, this person, this person to Christ, those works of you putting forth the effort, putting forth the time, going through the Bible, showing them the word of God, you know, helping them to understand and persuading them to put their trust in Jesus Christ as their savior, that's going to be part of your work that's put forward in the judgment of Christ. I don't see how anyone can say, yeah, that's just wood, hay, and stubble. That's just going to get burned up. Absolutely not. Right? Absolutely not. There's no way. There's no way you can, you can say that. And in fact, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16, you, again, just stay where you're at in, in 2 John. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. First of all, I just start off by saying, look, we must preach the gospel. Right? Like, like, woe unto me if I don't preach the gospel. There's a lot at stake, right? So it's commanded by God. It's something that we're supposed to do. It's incumbent upon us to preach the gospel. He says, it's, it's, it's necessary. Necessity is laid upon me to preach the gospel. But he says this, for if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. So if I do it willfully, if, I, if I'm going to go out and be like, yeah, I'm going to preach the gospel. I want to do this. I'm going to go out and try to get people saved. He says, I'm going to get rewarded for that. He said, but if against my will, dispensation of the gospel is commanded to me. He said, but... You know, if I don't want to do it, I still have to do it. Like, I'm still required to do it because it's something that God has given me to do. But if I go out willingly, then I will uh, receive a reward for that. In 2 John chapter 1, verse number 7, the Bible reads, For many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, this is a deceiver and an antichrist. Look to yourselves, look at this, that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. And I think there's, there's other verses similar to this where the thought could creep in. This is where for a while I kind of thought that we might be able to lose rewards. But, he, but what is he saying here specifically that we don't receive a full reward? Doesn't mean he's not going to get any reward, but they're not going to get that full reward. Verse 9 then says, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. So verse 7, to get this in the context, we start reading verse number 7. It's talking about deceivers entered into the world. And then verse 8 is talking about not losing the things that we've wrought or worked for but getting a full reward. And then verse 9 is, is expressing who's saved and who's not. Right? So there are people that you might think you've led to Christ. And by preaching the gospel and sowing the word and being a laborer, I believe you'll get rewarded for that just by putting forth the effort, just by going forth and doing the work. But when people get saved, when people, you know, when you're reaping that sheave, when, when people literally are, are, you know, become this new creature in Christ, you get a full reward for that. So he's, he's admonishing them to be aware, hey, watch out for these deceivers, right? Because they, they, they're going to try to turn people away from the truth. And we preach the gospel to all these people, but some of them might not be saved and they might fall away to these other believers, to these non-believers, to these, these people teaching wicked things. And, and then we won't get a full reward for that. We want to make sure that we get the full reward that these people could come to the saving knowledge of Christ. Not that they lose their salvation. He's just worried about people who just didn't get saved, that they've labored for ending up getting drawn away by a false prophet, right? This is a concern. And in fact, we'll see this in multiple other pas passages. Turn, if you would, to Philippians chapter 2. I'll read from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse number 5, the Bible says, For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith 
lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and our labor be in vain. So what's he want to know about them? Their faith. And what's he worried about, though, is labor being in vain. He wants the full reward, and he's worried about the people there. And we see in other epistles of the Apostle Paul, too, when work salvation creeps in, like in Galatians, the, in the book of Galatians, you know, he was worried that maybe some of those people just weren't even saved to begin with. Because right, did you just not even understand this? He's like, I, I worry about you. And, and he's expressing, you know, look, if someone brings another gospel, let them be accursed. Amen. Like, don't, don't even stand for that. You know, people are bringing in, oh, you must be circumcised, you must keep the law, you must do this, you know, something else for salvation. If people are starting to get carried away with it, he's going like, I don't even know if you guys are saved. Like, if you're, if you're really getting dissuaded by this, if you're getting persuaded to go that direction, are, are you even saved? And the reason why I would say that is because if you understand the gospel... Because you're saved, you know that salvation is not of any works. Like, that's clear. And for people to start believing in some other works-based salvation, he's going like, how could you, you know, you don't go from something that's free to something that costs you. If you fully understood and accepted that free gift to begin with. Philippians 2 is where I do turn, right? Verse number 14, the Bible says, Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. So, Again, he wants this full reward from these people that he's already ministered to, that he's already labored for, and he's saying, look, I want you blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke. And I believe this too, the more, so like, the more you're involved in someone else's spiritual life and their growth, and put it this way, building on that foundation that they have, not just your own. We think about 1 Corinthians chapter 3, building on your foundation of Christ. Well, what about building on someone else's foundation of Christ? And helping to build them up. And you're building them up with gold and silver and precious stones to help them spiritually improve their walk with God. You think you won't be rewarded for that? I do. I think that the effort and the labor that you put forth on someone else's building will earn you rewards. Because you're laboring. You're putting forth the effort. You're working. You're working for the Lord. And in fact, I think those will probably earn you. Now, this is just my thought. I think that'll earn you more rewards because that seems to be the mindset of Christ is being a servant unto others, right? And esteeming others better than yourselves. That's like the whole heart of, of being a Christian is being the exact opposite of self-centered but others-centered. That's what it's all about. I mean, that's the Christian life, exactly, is serving others. Serving others with the gospel, serving others to improve their life, you know, all of these things. That is the point, and that's exactly what Jesus did. That was the example he gave. He didn't serve himself. He didn't come to be served. Now, when he comes back, he's coming back as the king of kings, as the prince of princes, and he's going to set up the kingdom. He's going to rule with a rod of iron. But when he came and gave himself as an offering and also showed us the example, you know, what did he do? He washed the disciples' feet and said, hey, look, you see me do I'm your Lord and your master. You see me doing this. You ought to do this. He went around to the lame and the sick and the blind and healed. He went around and preached the gospel to the lost. He went around and did all these things to help other people. It wasn't for his own benefit. It was for the benefit of everybody else around him. Everything that he did was for everyone else's benefit, not his own. It clearly wasn't his own because what did he get in this world but people that hated him and were conspiring to kill him and you know, all these other things. He wasn't trying to do anything for himself. It's all for other people. That is the life. So if we're going to be building upon a foundation, hey, make sure that, that people have that foundation because anything then you try to build on that, it's not going to do any good. 
which also as a side note, by the way, is why we don't get into a bunch of doctrine with unbelievers. I don't try to convince a bunch of unbelievers on all these various doctrines in the Bible because they don't have the foundation if they're not saved. None of that stuff's going to matter. And the, and the Bible is already spiritually discerned. You need the Spirit of God to really help you to understand the, the spiritual things in the, in the Bible. So don't waste your time with that. If, if you know people aren't saved, focus on the gospel. Make sure they get that foundation. And then you can start building on that and helping them understand things and helping them to grow spiritually and become fruitful themselves. In Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul is exactly wanting that. He's like, look, I want, I want you to be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke. Why? That I may rejoice in the day of Christ. I don't want to be laboring and putting forth all this work in vain. Right? He's, he's putting forth a lot of work into people. Chapter 4, verse number 1, in Philippians there, the Bible says this, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and long for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. So he's calling the people, the Philippians, my joy and crown. And a crown is another reward, right? Like we receive rewards. Crowns are things that people are going to earn. In uh, turn, if you would, to Revelation chapter 2. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, I'll read this for you. While you're turning to Revelation 2, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 19, the Bible says, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For ye are our glory and joy. And that the, the timeline, which I definitely don't have time to, to really flesh this out, of the judgment seat of Christ, I believe, happens at the resurrection, essentially. So at the, what we also call the rapture, when the saints, the dead in Christ, shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them together in the clouds, and so shall we be ever, ever with the Lord. Right at, around that time is when the rewards, I believe, are going to be given out. Okay? But that's another message, I guess, to... to really hammer that out from Scripture. But I, I say that because the verse I just quoted for you in 1 Thessalonians 2, he's talking about the crown of rejoicing are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming. So tying together the, the crown of rejoicing with the second coming of Christ, which is the resurrection. Revelation chapter 2, look at verse number 10. And a lot of what we see with the crowns has to do with enduring. The Bible says in verse number 10, Fear none of those things which, shall, which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that you may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Now, I don't believe that the crown of life there is salvation. I think it's a crown as a reward. Because salvation is not a reward. Because it's not based on anything you did. Jesus did all the work for you. Eternal life is something that you have. It's, as, as a new creature, you, you just receive, you have that. Right? That's the gift that was given unto you, not the reward for your labors. This is a reward. This is a crown that you receive. And it's for those that are faithful unto death. And specifically here, he's talking to a specific church at the time saying, hey, look, tribulation's coming. You're going you're gonna to face this severe uh, tribulation, this trouble, and Satan's going to cast some of you into prison. He's like, just be faithful unto death. I've got a reward for you. I've got the crown of life for you. Just keep that in mind. When you're tried and, and you're going through this trial, just maintain that faith unto death. I've got a crown of life. Amen. Revelation chapter 3, if you want to flip over a page maybe, verse number 10, the Bible says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. This is another verse that gives the sense of losing a crown. Wow. 
And turn, if you would, to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Specifically, when we look at the crowns, and when I've studied this out, look at the crowns, this is where we have the most language that gives this sense of maybe you won't get it. And these are all tied to an endurance, right? To this race of finishing it and then receiving the crown. I believe the crowns are separate from other rewards that you earn just by laboring, right? You lead people to Christ, you get a reward for that. That work abides the fire. But a crown is, and as we're going to see this in the book of Philippians also, or in uh, 1 Corinthians, excuse me, chapter 9, it refers to the race, right? You're running a race, and nobody receives a crown or the reward in a race unless you finish the race, right? You have to complete the race. You have to, you have to finish it and finish it well, and that's why I believe we see this with the crowns, that there's some crowns you could miss out on, that if you don't quite finish it, if you don't endure unto death, like I said here, well, you're not going to get that crown of life. doesn't mean you're not saved, but you're not going to get that crown, Right? You backed out. You, you, you got weak when the, the trial came. I'll read for you from James 1, verse 12. The Bible says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Now you say, well, isn't that all saved people? No, not necessarily. Because in order to love Jesus, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So the way that you love Christ is by keeping his commandments. You say, well, how could someone not love God but be saved? Well, if they don't keep his commandments, you don't love God. But it doesn't make you unsaved. It doesn't mean you didn't receive the free gift. We should love God. And that goes also into, you know, love is not just a feeling. It's not just something you feel in your heart. Like someone could have a, 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 an emotion towards God, and you could call that love, but when the Bible's talking about loving, it's, it's in action and in deed, not just with your lips and with your mouth. It's in, it's, it's, you know, in deed and in truth. But in James 1.12, it's talking about someone who's tried. They're going through a trial, they make it through that, and then they receive the crown of life, just like we saw in Revelation. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 6, the Bible says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. This is the Apostle Paul knowing that his time, he's, he's old man now. And he's reaching that point where he knows, like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm about ready to, to die. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. He's like, I've, main, I've maintained faithful. I didn't get out of the faith. I, didn't, you know, I have stuck the course. I have run this race. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. So here's another crown that's mentioned, a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. And again, there's a reference to loving is appearing, loving the Lord. If you love me, keep my commandments. So he's receiving these crowns based on how he's lived his life, but enduring also to the end. First Peter chapter 5, we see a reward there given unto elders or pastors, bishops. The Bible says in First Peter chapter 5, verse number 1, the elders which are among you I exhort who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. So he's, he's, he, this is the teaching that Peter is giving to, to elders, to pastors. And he's saying, look, I'm also an elder. The apostle Peter was a pastor. He was an elder. And he says, here's what you need to do. You need to feed the flock. You need to take the oversight thereof. That's you're administering the things of God, not by constraint, not because you have to, but because you want to, right? It's a job that you want to do. It's not something you feel you're forced. I just have to do this. No, I want to do this. 
I want to serve God. I want to serve the people, not for money. I'm not doing this to get you know, this money or anything like that is what he's saying. You have to have a ready mind and you're not lords over God's heritage like you let this power trip go to your head and you just want to tell everyone what to do and control everybody. These are all the wrong things. If you're in it for the money, if you're in it just because you think you have to do it and you don't really want to do it, or if you think it because you just want to be in this position of power and control over people, those are all the wrong reasons. Amen. Right? You should not be serving God for any of those reasons. But be an, an example. You lead by example. You don't lead with the, just by saying, this is, how, this is just what you have to do. Right? The best leaders are able to lead by example. And you're going to have the most respect and the most people want to follow a leader like that. And say, hey, here's what we're going to do. Not here's what you're going to do. Here's what we're going to do. We're in this together. And I'm going to be, you know, first boots on the ground. And we're going to go out and do this together. Right? And here's how we do it. Follow me as I follow Christ. That's the example. And then it says in verse 4, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, because the elders are supposed to be these under shepherds, as these bishops, Ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So if you're doing all this for the right reasons, you're an elder, he says, look, you're going to receive a crown of glory. That's another reward. But again, I think that you have to finish that course faithfully. It doesn't say that specifically here. But as we've seen with the other crowns, it's a similar concept here. Galatians 6 is the last reference that we're going to look at in regards to these rewards, where this one also gives... Uh, somewhat of a, of a thought that we might not actually get it. Galatians 6, verse number 7, the Bible reads, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Right? You're going to reap in due season, but you got to stay with it. You can't faint. you got, you got to keep going. So all of this said and everything that we've looked at, here's what it looks like to me. There's what, when you do work that's of eternal value, it's clear you get a reward for that. And even the smallest thing that you do, it's eternal. No one's going to take that away from you. But there are definitely other crowns and rewards that you could receive only by remaining faithful and not backsliding. So there is other crowns, I'm sure, that Solomon could have earned for himself that he forfeited because he didn't remain faithful to the end like David, his father, did. Right? And that's also clear from Scripture that you know, people are constantly being compared to King David which, while King David didn't have the best life completely, he still trusted the Lord, he remained faithful, and he died faithful to the Lord and had a good testimony before God of, of remaining faithful unto the end. Not everyone had that, but that's why he was being used as the example and kind of the, the comparison against. One last point. I, just, I have to throw this in here. I know we're like out of time, but I didn't go to this earlier. I skipped over it. But if you want to earn rewards, of course, and if you want to, you can turn to 1 Corinthians 9. We have to do so the right way, <laughs> right? Um, and and I, I kind of feel like this should just be understood, but the Bible brings it up and references it. So I wanted to, to mention it as well. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 23, the Bible says, And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. So fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So he's talking about here doing things the right way. He's like, I need to be temperate in all things. I need to be in control because I'm running this race. 
And I don't want this sin which does so easily beset and will hold me back in my spiritual race that I'm running. I want to earn that prize. I want to earn that crown. I want to keep going. And, if, and the more sin I have, the more baggage I have that's going to hold me back from being able to win this race. Because the more sin you have, it's more likely to get you out of serving God altogether. You're going to backside and, and fall out. Right? So you, you need to, to get rid of that extra baggage to continue running the race and keep your body in subjection, meaning that you are controlling the lusts of your flesh, which are going to drive you to sin. So you're, you're walking in the spirit and doing these things to help you run the race appropriately and do it uh, the right way in order to get that crown, in order to make it to the end. So you know, hopefully this, this makes sense. When I, when I, a while back, I kind of just had this thought. It was actually, cha I was challenged on this a long time ago, over five years ago, on whether or not rewards were eternal. And at the time, because of a lot of the latter verses that we looked at, I was under the impression that, you know, you might be able to, you know, I, thought, I think you can just lose some if you don't endure to the end, if you don't really make it for that crown. But upon further investigation, I think it's clear that, look, the stuff that you've already done, you don't lose that stuff. But you could still earn greater rewards and crowns by enduring faithfully to the end. And the more that you can support and help other people to maintain their faithfulness, then the more rewards you're going to get also. So the people you've in, you invest in and spend time in, hey, continue to uh, you know, follow up and, and make sure people are doing well and serving the Lord themselves because those are going to be, that's the work that's going to be looked at for you to get a full reward. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we love you. We thank you so much for, um, reward, for, for the freeness of salvation because salvation in and of itself is just so awesome, dear Lord, that you would save our souls from hell and, and give us that opportunity to live with you and in your presence and um, in such a, a, a perfect world, dear Lord. Uh, we're looking forward to the time where um, we have that new heaven and new earth and we could live out our lives the way that it's always been intended to be without sin in this world, dear Lord. Uh, and we thank you for saving us to that and, and for paying for all of our sins. We also thank you, Lord, for um, not only saving us, but offering us rewards and, and offering to pay us for the work that we do here. Um, we know that, that um, it's not like you would have to do anything like that, but... Um, we're thankful that, that you do that, and I pray that you'd help us to keep the right mindset and to not just live for the moment here, but that we'd be mindful of our eternal future and of that judgment seat of Christ, that we could ensure that the work that we've done here is of eternal value and that you will um, find that value in, in all the things that we do so that we can have something to show for our life here and the work that we've lived while we, we've been on this earth. Uh, that, that ultimately we can just bring honor and glory unto the name of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen.